Our next speaker uh, is always a hard speaker to introduce because all of you know who he is. Um, <laughs> but I spoke with him and we've come up with a slightly different way about telling you, uh, to tell you his credentials, okay? Um, Rick Doblin. <laughs> I figured we might need a pause. Rick Doblin um, got into this work because he looked around and he saw um, you know, the Holocaust as a child and he saw the Cuban Missile Crisis and he saw as you know, a coming of age man the Vietnam War and he looked at these three events and he thought, you know, like the darkness is really everywhere. It's, it's all over the world. It's, you know, it's Germany, it's Russia, it's even our own country, even our own homeland. And he said, it's clear, to, it became clear to him that it was, uh, it was in a, this, there was this internal thing that we needed to fix if we were gonna fix, you know, the external problems. And so he uh, started doing a lot of work with psychedelics and also holotropic breath work with Stan Groff. And uh, that was to sort of cover the internal the internal side of things, but he also recognized that there was something that needed to be done uh, on the external front as well. And uh, so he got his uh, PhD in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and he has been ever since dedicating his life to uh, the work on the uh, external front through the internal front. Now, that's the biography, but I also want to tell you a little bit about uh, what's special to me about Rick. Okay. And one of the things is that he is always interested in bringing absolutely everybody there is into whatever, into whatever the work he thinks it's worth doing. And so he takes hippies and he takes scientists and he puts them together to be one movement. And <laughs> he's even willing to work with people that, that other people consider the enemies, like governmental organizations and the DEA and the FDA. And it's just a, si uh, a kind of testament to the size of his heart and his ability to bring everyone into what, what, what we're all trying to do and how important it is. Uh, the second thing I want to tell you is that allied <laughs> with that desire to bring everybody in, he just adores people. And last night he was the very last person to go to bed and he kind of looked at me. Me and my girlfriend were sitting there and we were kind of doing some like computer work and, and he said, I guess I'll go to bed wondering like if he should sit down and like keep hanging out with us because he just didn't want to go to bed until everybody had you know like felt good and that he could talk to everybody so he's just got a great giant heart and I, I think he's going to be saying a lot about how he feels about a lot of things from that giant heart today so I would like you to join me in welcoming Rick Doblin <laughs> Wow. Well, for, first I, I'd like to say it's, it's an enormous pleasure to be speaking at a conference that uh, I'm not organizing. <laughs> and if I were organizing it, it wouldn't have started at 9 in the morning. <laughs> and, th and that's why I went to bed. <laughs> um, so what I, I did speak last year, how many people were here last year? Just to give me a sense, not that many actually. So. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff that I did talk about last year. Um, and also, while I'm um, talking, um, you know, we will have a panel for all the, more, the afternoon speakers for questions. But during my talk, if any of you have questions, I'd prefer for you to ask them during the talk rather than wait to the end. So if you've got things on, in your mind, um, I guess we'll have somebody with a microphone. OK. Yeah, so feel free to just raise your hand and somebody will come and then you can ask the question because rather than sort of keeping it in your mind for later, and it might be questions that other people have too. So um, what I want to start with is just saying that when I was um, 18 and I was um, experimenting a lot with psychedelics and I was um, you know, under the delusion that um, the more drugs you took, the faster you would evolve. <laughs> and uh, it, it seemed like a reasonable thing. <laughs> Um, in, in practice, it didn't work out too well. And so out of confusion um, and uh, difficulty kind of uh, integrating everything, I decided to go to the guidance counselor at my college. So this is now um, 1972. 
And the, the guidance counselor was um, sympathetic. It, it, you, you'd be hard pressed to find that today, but at least at that time, right. the guidance counselor was very sympathetic. And he ended up giving me a book to read, and that book changed my life. And that was Realms of the Human Unconscious, Observations from LSD Research by Stanislav Grof. And so reading that book, it all came together for me. Um, and then I actually wrote Stan a letter. And um, he was at Johns Hopkins at the time. Um, and to my surprise, he actually wrote me back. And so I went up and took a seminar with him uh, in the summer of 72. Uh, and I did primal therapy. I did the encounter groups. I did everything I could think I, I could imagine doing. And I didn't end up where I wanted to be. And that's where I realized that I had completely underestimated the importance of integration work. And so um, that really led me into this 10-year period of, of working on integration, building houses, getting grounded, and then um, going back to school in the same place, and then going to um, Esalen to do a month-long workshop with Stan again. And that's where I learned about M MDMA in the summer, in the September, actually, of 82. But what Stan has said that was so inspiring, psychedelics are to the study of the mind what the microscope is to biology and the telescope is to astronomy. And when we think about the problems that people have had looking through the telescope and how people were burned at the stake for things that they um, learned from um, science, basically, that um, it's not that surprising that psychedelics, which are this incredible tool to bring uh, to the surface things that are unconscious, there, there would also be a lot of um, controversy over psychedelics. And so when we talk really about trying to reintegrate psychedelics into Western culture, it's really reintegration, not integration, because the longest running mystery ceremony that ever took place in the world that we know of were the Eleusinian mysteries in Greece. And they lasted for 2,000 years. And they involved a psychedelic potion called Kikion that looks like it had ergot uh, that is very similar to LSD in it. And this was wiped out in 396 by the Catholic Church. So historically, when we really think about what we're trying to accomplish, it's bringing psychedelics back into Western culture. And we could say that what um, the suppression of that kind of um, experiences led in some ways to the expansion of the rational mind. We were, we were sort of suppressing the irrational or the, the deeply emotional, the spiritual in that way, the mystical, the spiritual was all being suppressed, but we've had this enormous development of the rational mind. And now um, Einstein has said we have, um, our technology has exceeded our humanity. And so it became clear to me that um, I was like that as well. I was way overdeveloped intellectually, underdeveloped emotionally, and society was like that. So it just felt appropriate <coughs> to sort of refocus on trying to build this humanity, which to me means a um, certain emotional fluidity and a certain uh, sense of how we're all connected. So as soon as I started learning about um, psychedelics and LSD and Stan's work in the summer of um, 72, what I also learned was that there was uh, no access to LSD. <coughs> um, it was all criminalized. For those of you from Chicago, this is Lakeshore Drive. <laughs> so um, whoever made this sign must have had a really good sense of humor. <laughs> but um, the whole thing was criminalized and driven underground. <coughs> and the, the two main reasons that I really felt like it was crucial for me to devote my life for psychedelics, the first one is this um, concept that mysticism is the antidote to fundamentalism. That really we identify ourselves by our religion, by our race, by our gender, by our nationality, by our socioeconomic status, all the different ways that we decide who we are. And those are all really important ways to uh, participate in, in being human. But I think what we end up missing is there's something deeper underneath all of that, which is our shared humanity, our shared commonality. And so we see a lot of religions that are bumping up against each other, a lot of countries, a lot of ideologies, and how do we work through that? And so Robert Mueller was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And in 83, he wrote this book, New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And so I wrote him a letter, and I said, terrific book, totally I understand. He said basically that um, the UN is for mediating 
conflicts between countries, but underneath all of that is um, religious-based conflicts. And so we needed more a sense of this global spirituality. And that, that was his sort of theory of change, how we move forward, that we can see that we're all engaged in this common uh, effort to understand why we're here and how to act when we're here, but that religion is often used to divide us more than to connect us. And it was a beautiful book, but he didn't say a word about psychedelics. So I wrote him a letter and I said, here's the Good Friday experiment, here's other things that indicate that psychedelics can teach us about this mystical experience and, and would you help bring back psychedelic research? And uh, he also wrote me back. Uh, you know, I felt like I was a stranded sailor on a deserted island putting a note in a bottle and throwing it into the ocean and then he picked it up and wrote me back and he introduced me to a bunch of different people, uh, mystics from different religions, but this sort of confirmed the theory of change for me, that even politicians at the Assistant Secretary General of the UN level see that there is something about mysticism, about spirituality, that really is the key for humanity's survival. So I think that's one key reason to be working with psychedelics. But then the other is this idea of um, multi-generational trauma and how we heal from that. So we see through our own filters and those of us that have been traumatized either ourselves or historically um, are made it more difficult to see people who are different from us as something that people that we can communicate with, people that we can build bonds with, build bridges with. and so. This idea of um, using MDMA or other drugs as well to heal PTSD and multi-generational trauma will open the doorway for people to these mystical experiences. And, and it can't be just about mysticism. I don't think it can be just about healing trauma. It's about both of these sort of directions that will end up helping us have mass mental health, which is sort of the goal of MAPS. The picture is of Richard Rockefeller <clears throat> and Larry Brilliant. Um, so Richard Rockefeller was the um, chairman of the board of advisors of Doctors Without Borders. And he worked on Kosovo and Serbia. And there were so many people there that were traumatized that he started realizing that there's no way to really address that. There's not enough doctors, not enough therapists. The therapies don't always work as well. And so he started becoming interested in um, MDMA. And so Richard and I were sort of main thought partners for about five years before he died five and a half years ago in a plane crash. Um, but when he was alive, he came to me and he, he said, what is the hardest problem that you've got? And I'd like to help with it. And I said it was our relationship with the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense. They're the logical groups that should be really researching MDMA, but they're for political reasons, they're not doing it. And so we made some major breakthroughs. Fortunately, Richard's cousin was Senator Jay Rockefeller from West Virginia who was um, on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. So he helped us a lot as well. But again, these are the two kind of main streams why I think it's really crucial that we work and bring back psychedelics. Um, and there's a series of, of um, signs of progress that are rather astonishing, particularly for those of us that have been struggling for all these years or that went through the several decades uh, before Shannon was born. <laughs> <laughs> when all this research was um, completely shut down, not just in the U.S. And, and all over the world. And so one thing that was particularly um, satisfying for, for us to see was um, if you look at this slide, Bridging the Past, Present, and Future of Psychedelic Drug Research and Development, it's kind of a psychedelic slide. It's got images of Maria Sabina, mushrooms, psychedelic molecules and all. Um, but this slide was made by the FDA. This is the FDA D Division of Psychiatry Products. And they spoke at a conference in May, uh, American Society for Clinical Psychopharmacology. And so the fact that now they are moving forward to um, sort of be proud of the fact that they're opening this new renaissance in psychedelic research. And what they announced at this conference is that um, the FDA is now creating what's called a guidance document for psychedelic research. So basically what there are, there's laws that are passed by Congress, then the agencies, and in particular FDA, creates all these regulations of how you have to work with them. And then one level down from laws, from regulations, are these guidance documents. And so they're informal, they're not um, 
rigid as much as regulations are less rigid than laws, but that they are very helpful. And there's guidance documents about everything. So the fact that the FDA is now going to create a guidance document about psychedelic research, and they want us and the other groups that are promoting psychedelic research to help them develop this, it's a it's phenomenal sign of progress. Another sign of progress was this. This was a talk in May um, at Harvard Business School. So this is the legacy of Timothy Leary at Harvard, trying to get them to uh, bury the ghost of Timothy Leary and open up to psychedelic research. This was a talk that uh, George Goldsmith, who's the founder of Compass Pathways, the for-profit company that's trying to make psilocybin into a medicine and uh, has raised over $100 million, incredible uh, resources now to put towards psychedelic research. But the fact that the business school um, in May would be open to it um, is really remarkable. And so it was particularly satisfying to, to speak there. Um, this is another one that's rather uh, shocking. Um, so I gave a TED Talk, um, and I wanted to see uh, how many people had watched the TED Talk. So I um, went on my browser to it, and lo and behold, the National Security Agency, the NSA, is advertising for people that want to be spies on my TED Talk. Um, I couldn't believe it. Um, now, I, I assume they don't think that psychedelic people are more likely to you know, want to break codes or work at the NSA. I think that they must have a deal with TED, and they put it on all the different talks. But, but I don't know that. I haven't found that out. But this was, uh, you could imagine my shock <laughs> to, to go see the NSA advertising for people that want intelligence careers in the government on a psychedelic talk. Um, but strange bedfellows. This is an era of strange bedfellows. Um, another sign of progress is this, at the Medical University of South Carolina. So this is a, a, a bit of a story. So um, the first effort to do MDMA PTSD research in the United States was originally going to be at the Medical University of South Carolina. And that's where uh, Michael Mithofer and his wife Annie, they lived in Charleston, South Carolina. Michael had a lecture appointment at the Medical University. and. Um, there was a woman, Kathleen Brady, who was a senior tenured faculty there, who was an early researcher for um, Zoloft for PTSD. And she'd published, she was the lead author in JAMA, she was experts. And so she was friends with Michael, she was working with us sort of to guide the protocol development and give us advice and add credibility. And what happened before we finally got FDA permission is she decided she wanted to work at the drug czar's office. Uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and there was a number two spot for demand control. So the first one is the drug czar, the second is in charge of demand reduction. And so she um, was told that if she wanted to apply for that job, she had to quit any kind of association with the study, that they wouldn't even consider her for the job if she was involved with this terrible drug ecstasy and trying to look at its therapeutic purposes. So she ended up deciding she would quit the study and she didn't think it would hurt our ability to get approval, but she decided she wanted to go for this job. In the end, she did not get the job. And when we finally did get all the approvals for, from the FDA for the study, um, the medical university completely freaked out, and they told Michael that he needed to um, either quit the university or quit the study. And so Michael said goodbye to the university, and then we proceeded to the study. So that was uh, 15 years ago. And over time, as we've been making progress, as the media has shifted, the medical universities uh, sort of warming up a little bit more to what we're doing. And about um, a month and a half ago, Michael got a letter from the medical university saying, um, we realize now that you are far, far ahead of your time but we now have a donor that wants us to create a world-class psychedelic research center here at the medical university, and we want you to advise us on how to do that. Uh, so the medical university has sort of turned all around, and, and there is this uh, psychedelic research center at Johns Hopkins, at NYU, at the University of Zurich, elsewhere, but now the medical university in Charleston is going to become a, a psychedelic research hub. Um, and it's um, a very um, conservative, 
traditional Southern woman who has endowed business schools elsewhere that's going to be endowing this center. Um, so the other um, thing that's super um, satisfying for me in terms of signs of progress, now this is the Western IRB. So once um, Michael was um, sort of kicked out of the uh, Medical University of South Carolina, we were planning to use their institutional review board. You have to have FDA approval, but you need IRB approval. So once we were no longer affiliated with the medical university, we thought we would um, use um, a private site, and there's roughly 28 companies that you pay them to review your protocols. So they're private IRBs, and the largest one in the world is the Western IRB. So we ended up um, applying to the Western IRB, and we were delighted that they ended up approving the study. So we thought, a month after they approved the study, they sent us another letter. Again, this is 2004. They said, um, we feel now that you've lied to us. We're revoking the approval. We've called around and talked to various people, and MDMA is this terrible brain damaging drug, and one dose, fundamental brain damage, functional consequences, and we're um, really upset at you guys, and you know, just go away, and we're taking away your approval. And so what we ended up doing over the course of the next six months is uh, getting experts to write letters on every single point that we could imagine they were concerned about. And in the end, what the Western IRB said to us is they sent us a letter. They said, it's not about the science. We can't really argue with all of this. It's about the politics. We're never going to approve this drug. And here's your money back. So that's the most unusual thing. Uh, when you apply to IRBs and you pay them money, if they reject your protocol, you don't get your money back. They, they did their job. But they knew they didn't properly do their job. So they actually offered us our money back. But the problem is that once you get rejected at an IRB, if you want to go to the next one, you have to tell them that the first one rejected you, and you have to do all of the documentation before, which was sort of okay to us because we had all these letters, around 12 different letters from scientists, and we could document that they gave us the money back, that they didn't really do this on the basis of science. So we ended up going through um, seven different IRBs. Either they would refuse to accept the protocol for review at all, or they would say, we'll take a look at it, and then a month or two later, they would come back to us and say, we've decided for political reasons, we're not even going to evaluate it. So it was extremely frustrating. But I've, I've sort of learned um, about regulations. At this point, um, I'd gotten my PhD, and I learned that you can create your own IRB. If you're an institution, and MAPS is a nonprofit organization, and, and we could consider ourselves an institution, and so I looked at the regs, and we hired some uh, lawyers, and we had everything set to launch our own IRB. And I thought, okay, this is great. Now I can relax. We're going to get this study. But I thought, before we use our own IRB and launch that, it's kind of dicey to authorize yourself, even though it's independent who's on the IRB. So I thought I'll try one more time with one, another private IRB just to see if we can get approval. So I, I looked at the list of all the IRBs, and there was one called the Copernicus Group. And I thought, this is great, okay? If anybody is sympathetic <laughs> to science being blocked by religion or politics, it would be the Copernicus Group. <laughs> and so I, I sort of called them to live up to their name. And eventually, they did approve the study. It was fantastic. I mean, we had to um, purchase a million-dollar insurance policy to indemnify them in case any of the subjects sued them for approving the study. Um, the only reason they could be sued is if they hadn't fully disclosed the risks in the informed consent form. So we had the world's largest and longest informed consent form, so long that we had to develop a quiz at the end to make sure people got the main points. But they also required us to um, hire an emergency room doctor and emergency room nurse, board certified, to sit in the next room in case somebody had a heart attack or a stroke from taking MDMA. So we've spent over $100,000 on the insurance for the IRB on this uh, emergency room doctor and nurse. Eventually, they let us get rid of both of those. They were never called. No insurance claims, no need for these other people. So we've been since working with the Copernicus, Copernicus Group ever since. So we have a 15-year relationship with this Copernicus Group, which is this remarkable IRB. So then you could imagine my um, anxieties when two years ago, the Western IRB bought the Copernicus Group. 
<laughs> I'm like, oh my God, you know, now what are we going to have? But fortunately, so much has changed since then that um, the Western RB is actually fine with what we're doing, uh, proud of what the Copernicus group did. And so um, last Friday, not um, yesterday, but the week before, I was in Seattle, and I was invited by the Western IRB Copernicus Group to give a talk to their fall training of 200 members of their boards on their IRBs all over the country. And the night before, the, they wanted to talk about psychedelic research and educate these board members. And so the night before the talk, I said to them, um, do you mind if I share a bit of the history <laughs> of the Western IRB, what you did. And I talked to this one man, and he was the one that actually wrote us the letter that said, here's your money back. And he said, no, it's probably better you don't talk about it. It's a little bit embarrassing for us. Um, you know, some of our board members are here, and you know, those are the ones that really instigated this rejection letter, and you'll be criticized. So I was like, all right, I don't want to make waves. And in the morning, right before my talk, the same fellow came up to me, and he said, um, yeah, you can go ahead and tell the story. So it was tremendous to be able to share with these board members that they have this extra responsibility to separate out politics from science. When they're trying to review other things, we're not the last controversial project that's going to come for review before these IRBs. So the fact that in this 15-year cycle, we're now welcomed back and even welcome to share the story of, of their initial reaction was tremendous. So it, it really feels like we've turned a major corner. Um, another example of it is just one of our um, donors is very interested in bringing MDMA to China. So um, I was there, Amy Emerson, the head of our um, Benefit Corp was also there. The um, head of our principal investigator in Israel who was the former chief psychiatrist of the Israeli Defense Forces, um, he went along and so we have a training starting uh, next week um, in Asheville for therapists, and there's going to be, I think, eight Chinese therapists coming for training. Like eight of them? Is that right? Okay. So just to see that now we're really trying to globalize, and we're really trying to share this with the world. So this is the, the structure of MAPS. Um, basically, what I, when I started MAPS, MDMA was in the public domain because it was invented by Merck in 1912. And the same year that I started MAPS in 86, another group started um, called NDA International. And their job was, their company was to develop Ibogaine for opiate addiction. And they had patents on the use for Ibogaine for opiate addiction. And they decided to do it in a for-profit way. And what shortly thereafter happened is that some of the early researchers that were doing the Ibogaine work started discovering um, long-lasting metabolites, other things, and then everybody started suing each other for intellectual property. And it just destroyed this whole field of Ibogaine research for decades and decades. And now, fortunately, those patents have expired, so we can think again about Ibogaine for opiate addiction. But that led me to hire the patent attorney for Ibogaine, and I said, I want you to develop an anti-patent strategy so nobody could ever patent any of the uses of MDMA. So we developed an anti-patent strategy. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and basically to patent something, you have to be the inventor of it. And so if we have people that have gotten MDMA, somebody had MDMA um, and they got rid of rheumatoid arthritis. Now that's kind of an unusual thing. It's not clear it's cause and effect, but we have them write a story. It's up on our website and it becomes in the public domain. So it's gonna be very difficult or impossible for anybody to say I'm patenting MDMA for rheumatoid arthritis. So we have all sorts of stories on our website of all sorts of things. So I always thought that once MDMA becomes a medicine, it's immediately generic. But what I didn't realize, and I'll go to this, is that uh, Ronald Reagan in 1984 had signed a very, um, interesting law to provide incentives for developing drugs that are off patent. And that is called data exclusivity. So they can't give patents, but it, what it means is if you present the data to the FDA, and um, then the FDA will say no one can use your data for five years to market a generic. Somebody else, some other company could make MDMA and do medicine for PTSD. They would have to generate their own data. And if you do pediatric studies, 
which we are being required to by the FDA, then you get six months data exclusivity extension. What, what that means is if we succeed in adults, we have to do studies in 12 to 17 year olds with trauma. And if that works, we have to do seven to 11 year olds. And why I think it'll work, Guo will explain her octopus and mice study, but I think MDMA's effect, pro-social effect, goes so deep evolutionary that it's pre-verbal. And so I think it'll even work with kids who have this inability to really verbalize what's going on with them. So I actually use that, your, your research as an explanation why it makes sense potentially for us to do work in kids. But in any case, you get six months data exclusivity, and then it also uh, takes the FDA about six months to review generic manufacturers licenses, and they can't apply for till this five and a half years is over. So more or less, we'll have six years of data exclusivity. So then I realized that we could actually tell our donors a different story. Instead of saying, give us money, donate money for a good cause, but once MDMA is a medicine for PTSD, we're going to need to keep having donations. Now the different story is we can sell MDMA at a profit, but at a reasonable profit, and we can use whatever profits we make for more research. And so we created the MAPS Public Benefit Corp. So if you look around at healthcare in America, I think it's completely warped out of all recognition by the profit motive. And we have higher per person expenditures on healthcare than any country in the world, but our outcomes are way low compared to other countries that have national healthcare systems. So we are at a, syst a system that's profit driven. And I think what we want to model is not just new approaches towards uh, mental illness, meaning psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but new approaches toward marketing drugs and providing healthcare. And so we created the MAPS Public Benefit Corp. And so public benefit corps are a modification of capitalism where you maximize public benefit, not profit. And so it is a for-profit. We, we were told by our accountants and lawyers that selling MDMA to profit is something that can't stay inside the nonprofit. It's taxable. It has to be taxed and it has to be at some different kind of corporation. So we created the Public Benefit Corp, which is for profit, but it has only one investor, which is the nonprofit. So the nonprofit owns 100% of the Public Benefit Corp. People donate to MAPS. We invest in the Public Benefit Corp. They do the research and eventually we'll market MDMA. And then the resources that come back to them will be used for the purposes of MAPS and the Public Benefit Corp. So th that's our corporate structure. Um, and um, just just the way Brian thanked his core team for organizing the, the conference, I just want to share that we've now got about 58 people working for MAPS, all survived on donations. Um, we have our uh, MAPS, which is the nonprofit and various functions. You heard yesterday from uh, Sarah and Ryan from the Zendo team. We have communications, fundraising, leadership, media, uh, various events. Um, operations um, and advocacy, a small uh, advocacy team. And then we have um, our clinical research team, which has got even more people that are on here. And we, we call these the refugees from Big Pharma. And uh, a lot of them came from Novartis, um, which is beautiful symbolically because Novartis is the company that gobbled up Sandoz. And Sandoz was where Albert Hoffman worked when he invented LSD and then synthesized 15 years later um, or when he discovered, he invented LSD in 38, and 43 is when he accidentally dosed himself and figured out LSD was psychedelic. And then uh, in 58 is when he identified psilocybin as the active ingredient in mushrooms. So the legacy of the psychedelic influence in pharma is now carried through Novartis, and then we've hired a bunch of people from Novartis are now leading our clinical team. And we also have um, our therapy training program, our... our, our um, supervisors, our principal investigators, and just to give you a sense, this is only a fraction of the 500 people that we've trained um, all over the world and all these different set, uh, experiences. So the most recently our training for therapists of color in August. So we have all sorts of uh, expanding uh, efforts. And so this is the future vision for MAPS. So um, MAPS is at the bottom, again, the nonprofit. The, the solid lines are companies that MAPS either 100% owns or may eventually control. And the dotted lines are from those companies back to the Public Benefit Corp at the top. So the staff at the Public Benefit Corp will manage the affairs, the research from these different companies. So we have the Benefit Corp. We have our therapy training program. We have 
expanded access, compassionate use, and our core research. We have MAPS Europe, which we've just started because we need a European company to move MDMA through the European Medicines Agency. We'll have future global companies in other countries where we market MDMA. And we're starting to think about being like, in some ways, like a traditional pharmaceutical company with a pipeline of uh, drugs that we want to research, including cannabis, ibogaine, and ayahuasca. So those are future benefit corporations that we may set up for these different things. Some of them may have investors. It's, it's unclear how we're going to make progress in these areas. For cannabis, just to say this, that uh, the donors would rather pay to legalize marijuana than they would to medicalize it. So um, in Michigan, where they passed a um, marijuana legalization bill, friends of ours wrote that bill, and there's a, a little paragraph that they have to spend $40 million, $20 million a year for two years, for understanding cannabis and helping veterans to reduce veteran suicides, and the money can only go to nonprofits or academic researchers. So there's $40 million there. <laughs> um, we realize that a lot of the academic centers in Michigan will try to grab the money for mechanism of action. So there's a lot of advocacy work we still need to do. But in any case, this is the future vision of MAPS. Um, and we've got uh, all these phase three uh, locations. We heard before, 15, uh, two in Canada, two in Israel, and the rest in the United States. And so in terms of our progress, um, we need to have two 100-person studies um, phase three studies demonstrating safety and efficacy. Um, they may need more than 100 people. It depends on how many people we actually need to get statistical significance, but they cannot be less than that. The FDA has said that we can prove efficacy for smaller numbers than they want to see for safety. So we are doing two 100-person studies, and the first study is now um, 60, 60 people. We've enrolled 60% of the people, in, or actually 61 of the 100 participants have enrolled. And what we're moving towards, well, I'll say this, five participants have dropped out. And so we're not able to uncover the blind until the end. But these five participants who've dropped out said it was too painful for them to be in the study. It was too painful for them to confront the trauma. And as far as we can tell, all of them seem to be in the placebo group. So if that is really true, that's a tremendous statement about how the MDMA helps the other people stay in the treatment and also how this kind of a design, um, it's clear to um, the FDA as well as to us, um, as well as to anybody that really pays attention, that the double-blind design is very difficult or impossible to do with psychedelic drugs that are so have such a strong subjective effect. All right, so what we're going to be doing now with the first study is called an interim analysis. And so the thing that you need to know here is that the whole system of FDA is um, biased, you could say, or slanted or, or designed to help pharmaceutical companies succeed. So normally, when you do a scientific study, you, um, you size it, you do power calculations, you make a certain size uh, that you think you're going to need to get statistical significance, and then you do the study. And at the end, you look at your results, and you either succeeded or you failed. However, with pharmaceutical drug development, you can have a small group called a data monitoring committee that at a certain point, which you set up ahead of time, is unblinded. They take a look at the data, but their purpose is to, design, is to tell the sponsor a number. All I'm going to get is a number, and it's going to be either zero, which means we don't need to add anybody to the study, or it's going to be five or 10 or 20 or whatever that number happens to be. And that's the number we would need to add to get statistical significance. And it's perfectly appropriate to do that. The, the sad part of that means is that if you have to add more people, the effect wasn't as large. It means something is not working as we originally predicted, but we'll still get the drug approved, and then it'll be sorted out with insurance companies and then in the marketplace how often it's used. So the interim analysis is now going to be taking place, we estimate, in March of 2020. So that's going to be the real key moment for us. And based on the number that I'm told, we'll be able to predict the remaining costs, the remaining timetable, and the, the remaining number of subjects that we need to obtain FDA approval. 
And we're going to also be trying to do research in Europe. So we've already negotiated with the European Medicines Agency. They're accepting the data from the U.S. So we only have to do one 70-person study in Europe in seven different countries. Um, one of the two great things that happened there is um, after we had our meeting with the European Medicines Agency, we had several of the MAP staff that were there in person, myself and a few others. Um, and then we had several MAPS people who were on the phone from uh, California and participating in this meeting. And so you have this meeting, we present our, our information, we discuss it, and then a month later we get a letter from the EMA. So after we had the meeting, a group of us went to another room to sort of debrief, and we started talking and talking, and that took an hour, and then, then we leave. And then after we left, we got a call from some of the MAP staff, and they said that the European Medicines Agency people had forgot to turn off the microphone <laughs> for their call, so that they were able to actually listen in on the deliberations of the EMA staff, their scientific advice working. Now, I am sneaky, but I would not have intentionally like bugged their meeting. But since they voluntarily did that for us, um, and the, the reason I share this is that the main thing that our people heard is that they said we had persuaded them about safety, that we had to prove efficacy, but they were not concerned about safety. They're not concerned about brain damage. They're not concerned about other aspects of safety. In a way, you can kind of understand it because we're only giving MDMA a few times. It's not like a daily medicine, but that's, that's the situation there. So um, we will be ready um, sometime around um, October or so of 2020 to launch phase three in Europe. We're, we're now getting protocols approved, we're training the therapists there. So assuming the interim analysis goes well in March of 2020, then we're gonna have about um, uh, six months or so to raise $8 million to bring MDMA to Europe. And um, these are the countries that we're gonna do it in. And um, because the FDA is going to accept the U.S. data, it's costing us $34 million for phase three in the U.S., all of which we have raised already. Um, you know, if I get a big number of how many more subjects that we have to treat, we'll need to raise more money. But um, it's basically, we think, $34 million to make MDMA into a medicine in the U.S. doesn't count our prior research to get to this phase three point. Um, and then for EMA, it's only going to be about $11 million. So it's tremendously effective. So what we're also trying to do politically is um, really educate the VA and educate experts in the field of PTSD research. So we are now paying to have PTSD experts blend MDMA with their existing non-drug psychotherapies. And the first one that we've already completed is uh, cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy. So it's dyads where one member has PTSD and it affects the relationship and we're able to give MDMA to both members of the couple. And this was a study that Candace Monson at Ryerson in Toronto, she helped develop this. And what we've uh, done six dyads, it was tremendously effective. Um, MDMA is tremendous for uh, couples therapy, um, but we cannot make MDMA into a medicine for couples therapy. The FDA has already confirmed that for us. It's not a disease. You can only medicalize diseases. So one of the best uses of MDMA is going to be either off-label or require um, legalization for people to get access to it in this way. But this is a way for us to sort of back into couples therapy. So there's a lot of measures of the strength of the relationship, but the real primary outcome measure is the PTSD scores, the PTSD symptoms of the person that has PTSD. Um, there's also a program uh, therapy called Cognitive Processing Therapy with Ann Wagner, who's a student of uh, Candace. So we're funding this project also in Toronto that's close to starting. One of the main approaches uh, towards treating uh, PTSD is called prolonged exposure. And so this is Barbara Rothbaum is at Emory in Atlanta. So she's started with animal studies. Now she's doing a human MDMA fear extinction and memory reconsolidation study in healthy volunteers. And we're moving very close to starting prolonged exposure. Um, Edna Foa, who developed prolonged exposure, um, is now going to be working with us on developing MDMA combined with prolonged exposure in Jerusalem. And, and this is another example of progress. Um, Ten years ago, in 2009, there was a conference in Jerusalem on PTSD, and Edna was there, Michael Midhofer and I were there, and we were trying to interest her in MDMA, and she's like, MDMA is like dynamite in the brain. It's a terrible thing. 
forget about it. I want to have nothing to do with it and just go explore virtual reality. And as it turned out, there was a fellow named Skip Rizzo who's got loads of money from the Department of Defense to develop virtual reality for PTSD. And so I went to him. I said, Edna's like terrified of MDMA, dynamite in the brain. And um, he says, I should, she says, I should talk to you about virtual reality. And Skip just started laughing. And he said, if you have MDMA, you don't need virtual reality. <laughs> because it's your own exact memories that really count. Um, and so now, uh, we just recently had dinner with Edna in uh, Tel Aviv. And she's wanting to get involved. And she wants to. Um, um, sort of say that uh, it was, was never really about MDMA for her. It was about our therapeutic approach, which is too unstructured for her. She says therapists need structure. You know, so we have a very unstructured approach in that we let people, the inner healer, whatever emerges as people are um, under the influence, we work with them in whatever order. We feel that there's this inner knowledge, this inner healing. And so, um, so now we're happy to, to work with Edna, the, the queen of PTSD research, is now looking at MDMA. Um, there's also a woman, uh, Rachel Yehuda, who's at the Bronx VA. And so we've been trying since 1990, 29 years, to do research inside the VA. And it looks like uh, Rachel may be the first to get permission to do it. And she's very renowned for epigenetic research, where she worked with Holocaust survivors and their children and, and was able to identify ways in which mothers transmit certain kinds of um, stresses and traumas to their children through epigenetic changes. And she's also very interested now in um, looking at two sessions for versus three sessions. That'll be her first protocol. Um, we're also looking at group therapy. That's going to be another way to see about um, is it more effective or less effective? Is it less expensive? How do we do it? We were working with uh, Brian Anderson at UCSF, but he wants to do a group therapy study starting about a year from now, but not in veterans, but in um, people with trauma from um, being discriminated against because of sexual, sexual orientation. And there's a lot of people that are traumatized from that. So we do want to work uh, in group therapy. At Yale, we've uh, supplied, um, we've trained the therapists, and this is going to be the first study ever that is taking a PTSD patient under the influence of MDMA and sticking them in a scanner. And so there have been PTSD patients have been scanned, and we understand how PTSD changes their brains. There have been people, healthy volunteers, who've taken MDMA and been in scanners, and we see how their brains are operating. But there's never been a PTSD patient under MDMA in a scanner. And so this is also going to be done at Yale. And there's another aspect of this study, which is, again, we're the way that we've designed our projects and the way that we've designed our approach is to say, our operating principle is we're going to maximize therapeutic outcomes. That's the thing. We're not so much thinking about economics. We're not so much thinking about how insurance companies are going to cover it. We're thinking, what are the best results we can get? So we do have a male-female co-therapy team, two therapists. We have overnight stays. We have three MDMA sessions. But it's optimizing therapy outcomes. So what this study is also doing in a kind of a, a quiet way, we're not even really announcing it in that sense, but it's going to be looking at what MDMA does with the minimal amount of therapy. So people are going to get like one hour or so of prep for being in this study, these PTSD patients. Then they're in the scanner only for an hour. There's about uh, eight hours at the end. We're not going to give them supplemental doses, so they'll be about six hours. And they will be with therapists during the other period of time that they're not in the scanner. And there'll be a very minimal um, integration day the next day. But it's, it's the minimal amount of therapy that we felt could be ethically delivered. And if they need more, they can get it. But this is also a way to try to understand what MDMA might be able to do with minimal amount of therapy. Um, we're also working um, with a Dr. Ben Sessa. We've trained him and his team. And we've provided the MDMA. And this is a study for MDMA for alcoholism. So again, this theory that it's trauma often that drives people to um, run away through drugs. And if you treat the trauma, you might be able to help the alcoholism. And He's got really, really good results here. And we're also about to start um, uh, the final design stages for MDMA for eating disorders. And that's going to be in Toronto, Vancouver, and uh, Denver. And also the um, Jeffrey um, Lieberman, who's head of psychiatry at Columbia, wants to do, uh, is interested very much in a study with MDMA and schizophrenia. So we're moving forward in the early stages of trying to design that as well. 
So just a few things from the regulatory perspective. Um, while um, drugs are being studied, there's 8 million people with PTSD in America, and we only need a couple hundred in our study. And so the FDA has this program called Expanded Access, or Compassionate Use. So while you're doing phase three, as long as it's not slowed down, we can open up what expanded access sites. That's what we're hoping to do in Philadelphia, elsewhere, eventually here in Pittsburgh. And that these are sites where people can get access to MDMA, but they have to accept the risk because it's not fully studied, and they have to pay for it themselves because the data is not used by the FDA to approve the drug. The FDA wants the safety data just to be careful, but they don't pay any attention to the efficacy data because there's no control group. So we are negotiating right now with FDA. We anticipate that in the next three weeks or so, we'll be approved for expanded access. And I just got an email from some people at Johns Hopkins where they were wondering how we can uh, teach them everything we know about expanded access so they can think about creating expanded access for psilocybin. So right now, there's only expanded access uh, about to be for MDMA. And what's taking us um, a lot of also negotiations is this idea of the REMS. So, so that's risk evaluation and mitigation strategies. So the question is, once MDMA becomes a medicine, if it does, how should it be regulated? And most drugs that are made into a medicine, once they're approved, then any doctor can prescribe them not just for what they're approved for, but also off-label. And so we feel that that's an inappropriate, too risky approach to psychedelics because really the drug is not the treatment. It's drug-assisted psychotherapy. And so what we've proposed to FDA and to DEA and what they both seem to appreciate is that we're suggesting, and they are going to um, write this into the REMS, that the only people that can prescribe MDMA and the only people that can treat patients are people that Shannon has trained. <laughs> so only the people that have gone through the sponsor's training program will be able to prescribe and treat patients because they will learn about the therapeutic use of it. And they will only be able to give it under direct supervision and only uh, with a few centralized pharmacies. So it's not... The, the drug is never prescribed to the patient. It's prescribed to the, the doctors, the clinics, and the patients receive it. But they don't actually ever prescribe it, and there are certain kind of safety screenings that have to be done. The things that are at the bottom of the line are things that the FDA could ask for us, but we initially thought they wouldn't. One is a lifetime limit on doses, which would be in the range of 10 to 12. They might require that for PTSD, and the other is a patient registry. So the more that we've been looking into it, um, what's becoming clear to me is that the patient registry is also likely to be required by FDA. So every patient who um, wants to get MDMA will need to um, be part of a registry at the FDA, and the doctor and the patient need to send in that. They, you don't actually say what the diagnosis is, but you just give a lot of identifying information about them, their past history, but not what they're being treated for because the FDA cannot regulate off-label prescriptions and cannot require that it only be for PTSD. So this is how we think the REMS is going to be. Um, what we're re negotiating now with FDA is really difficult. It's about the qualifications of the two teams, so the two people co-therapy team. So we do want it to be ideally a male-female team. It doesn't need to be. It could be people that are non-binary. It could be two women. It could be two men. But basically... People that are traumatized, mo a lot of people are traumatized, but not a lot of people get PTSD. Those people that actually get PTSD often have had a series of traumas, often going back into childhood, and they have attachment disorders, other problems like that. And so to having a well-functioning kind of mother, father, male, female team that's there for you to help you grow, it can provide a lot of healing for things that people didn't get when they were growing up. So for the psilocybin, research. The FDA has required both USONA and COMPASS to have a two-person team, but the first person they're saying ha has to have an MD or a PhD and has to be through the sponsor's training. And the second person they're saying just has to have a bachelor's and just trained by the sponsor. Um, uh, let me just finish this and then you can ask the question. So for MDMA, what they're requiring, we've got a better deal on the first person. It's, 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 um, there's no real need for the first person to be an MD or a PhD. They just need to be licensed as a therapist. 
and then um, either a psychiatrist or licensed to perform therapy. So not any doctor, but a licensed to perf a psychiatrist or licensed to perform therapy and our training. Where we're arguing with the FDA is about the second person. Currently, the FDA has said the second person needs to have a license as a therapist also. So we're saying, no, that's not necessary. We want that person to be a student working for credit for hours under supervision and charging either working for free or for very little. So that we want to keep the two-person team, but we want to change the economic aspects of it and have one of them be a student. So the FDA has, said, has not said yes to that, but for psilocybin, they have said the second person can be that. So we want our first person and the psilocybin second person and combine them, and that's what we're going to um, try to eventually get approved. And I think we will get there eventually. Um, this is our therapy training program. Um, all these different parts. Um, it, it takes quite a while, but one of the key things that's different from us in the psilocybin team is that we believe that therapists should be able to get MDMA as part of their training, that that's essential. The psilocybin people don't think so. So you had a question, though? Can you back up? and Can you explain what off-label is? Ah, yes. Okay. So that's a really good question. So the label is um, what the drug is approved for. So MDMA-assisted psychotherapy will be approved for PTSD. Off-label is where you prescribe it for something else, or at least initially if you prescribe it for um, adolescents with PTSD, because this will only be for adults 18 or over. So any kind of prescriptions that are not exactly for what the drug was approved for, and about 30 to 40% of US prescriptions are off-label. Because even if you do a different dose, that's considered off-label or a different frequency. And in 1986, when Marinol, the oral THC pill, became a medicine for nausea control for cancer treatment therapy, the DEA tried to block off-label prescription. They said because it's a Schedule One drug, or was, um, it's so dangerous, nobody should be able to prescribe it off-label. And so the American Medical Association and the American Pharmaceutical uh, Manufacturers Association um, or no, the American Pharmacy Association, um, they legally objected and the DEA had to withdraw that ruling. So that established that off-label prescriptions can take place for Schedule One drugs. In Canada, for example, you can't even have expanded access for Schedule One drugs. So there's no such thing as expanded access in Canada for MDMA. There are people trying to change that, but, but that's what off-label is. And the basic thing there is that insurance companies, we hope, will eventually cover MDMA for PTSD, but they won't cover off-label uses until we do more studies to get that approved. Um, so we are moving into uh, Ibogaine for opiate addiction, uh, pre-I and D meeting. It's, it's, we have to have a big meeting with FDA about all of the data, about the risks. You know, Ibogaine can actually kill people through heart problems, but if it's monitored properly, nobody should die, and it can be very helpful. So we're hopefully in six months or so going to have this pre-I and D meeting with FDA. Uh, about Ibogaine. We also have an incredible situation with ayahuasca, which is um, this woman in the middle, Victoria Hale, is a new addition to the MAPS Board of Directors. And so she worked five years at the FDA, uh, multiple years at Genentech, and then got tired of the um, for-profit. I think there's a question back there. Uh, my question about Ibogaine is I wonder if there's any fast track kind of impetus because of the opioid epidemic nationally. I know you had said that was being investigated for opioid addiction. You, you would think so, but because it's a psychedelic, there, there is not that at all. And in fact, the National Institute on Drug Abuse about six years ago gave a for-profit company a six and a half million dollar grant to develop the non-psychedelic version of Ibogaine called 18MC. Nothing has ever come from that. They ref they, they've, uh, we need roughly two and a half million dollars to do a phase one, two safety study with Ibogaine. Um, and we're not gonna get it from the government. So that, that's still the problem. There's a massive national crisis. You know, last year more people died of drug overdose. More, okay, last year more Americans died of drug overdoses last year than Americans died in the entire Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan wars. And when you just try to wrap your head around that, and why is it that, that Ibogaine is not being fast-tracked? Why isn't it everything we can think about for opiate addiction? But there still is, at least at the federal government level in terms of funding, 
and hopefully that will change soon, but it hasn't changed yet. So the, the, there's no fast track yet for Ibogaine. Um, for ayahuasca, so uh, Victoria started a the non the largest nonprofit pharmaceutical company called One World Health, which was um, 100 million dollars they got or 150 million dollars they got from the Gates Foundation for Drugs for Africa. Then she got a call from the Buffett family, and they said, uh, "Do you want to develop low-cost contraceptives to the world?" And she said yes. So then she started Medicines 360, and then for personal reasons, she started trying ayahuasca. And she's like, hey, this is a good drug. <laughs> um, and so now she wants to help make ayahuasca into a medicine. Um, so we're, she's on our board of directors. She's giving us a lot of uh, advice and credibility. And we will be trying to develop a standardized version of ayahuasca. Um, we, we can do it in um, freeze-dried encapsulated capsules. Or uh, pharmawasca, you could make uh, harmaline and DMT. Or we can do it in the tea. And so Victoria said, let's try to do it in the T, the way it's normally used. And so that's the form that we're going to try to do. And the way you get standardized supply is you end up working on all your production methods. You get all those worked out. And then you pick your level of, D8, um, your level of DMT and your level of harmaline. And then after every batch is made, you test. And if it's um, not exactly the way it should be, then you add in... DMT and harmaline that you've previously extracted from the plants and synthesized them. And so that way you can kind of keep the tea the same strength. So at least that's the way we think we're going to do um, plant-based botanical medicines through the FDA. And the last thing that I'm going to share with you very briefly, this is outside of medicine, back to sort of let's uh, try to make the world a better place. Uh, and so psychedelics are really good for, or we believe they can be very helpful for conflict resolution. And so there's a project that we're working on in Israel, and it turns out, with this is with Robin Carr Harrison, Imperial College, and his team, that there's a bunch of Israelis and Palestinians that are already doing ayahuasca and MDMA together. It's illegal. They're doing it quietly and underground, but there's a bunch of them doing this. And so we have a three-year project. Um, the first year is interviewing people. And... Um, the second and third year is going to be actually controlled studies and looking at measures of um, how we might evaluate, are these groups coming together? You know, what's your view of the other? Um, how much are your levels of trust? But the first year, which we're still in the, near the end of, is these interviews. And so we've interviewed um, 31 Palestinians and Israelis who drink uh, ayahuasca. The Palestinians have underground uh, therapists who work with them with MDMA first before they're ready to be in these more conflictual spaces with Israelis. So they work through their uh, some early traumas with MDMA, then they go into these mixed spaces, and we want to learn you know, how we do this. And so of these participants, uh, 18 Israelis, 13 Palestinians, they're Muslims and Christians, uh, they've drank ayahuasca between 10 and 100 times. So these people are coming back to these settings, um, and usually the Palestinians are in a minority. And w the setting is that it has always taken place inside um, Israel. So it's, it's been difficult for some of the Palestinians to come there, from the West Bank in particular. Um, what we're thinking about is that for the controlled studies, it will be better to take them outside the land of conflict, Spain or Portugal or Colombia or the U.S. potentially. Um, and what we've heard so far is that people talk about um, healing trauma. They bond with the ayahuasca tribe regardless of these cultural barriers. There's more connections with the other outside the tribe. Um, they no longer have this definition of their political identity as their primary sense of who they are, stronger connection to the land. And also, they um, see more uh, nonviolent activism. It, it changes how they think political activism. And so I'll. Uh, conclude by uh, uh, real, real quick, Rick. Yeah. Uh, it said Palestinians and Israelis sit separately. Are they in the yeah. same circle or? Uh, yeah, they're in the same circle. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Really good. And and again, these are not the hardcore haters from either side. You know, these are more of the peace activists. So, it's in a way this idea of training the trainers. These are the most willing people to be in these conflict. Uh, you know, with people that they have conflicts with. And then once they start seeing that it can work, then they'll move out in their own communities to more and more people who have more um, sort of difficult views of the other. Yeah? 
Okay. I'm just wondering how you define or differentiate medicines and drugs. <laughs> um, I think that um, I've never, uh, well, um, you know, me I think that medicines, you know, are too limited. So psychedelic, to call psychedelics medicines, I think is too limiting. Right. Because um, psychedelics are medicines. They are medicinal, but they have spiritual purposes. They have celebratory purposes. That they can be used in a variety of ways. Drugs, um, you know, basically means medicines, but also it has this pejorative context of, you know, recreational drugs and somehow or other illegal drugs. So I think that... Um, what we have there is this idea that rec it's, it's diminishing the value of recreation right. and of celebration. So basically I'd say that the, those kind of old definitions don't really hold water. They're not that. And, and the better thing for me at least is that these drugs are tools. And if we think of them as tools, they can be used in any number of different ways. And that also relates to this whole question of cultural appropriation. So yeah. can we take ayahuasca out of um, Christian syncretic religious traditions, the way it's been used in the Amazon, and bring it to the West? Can we take iboga, or iboga is the root, ibogaine is the active ingredient, out of the Bwiti religion from Gabon, and can we use it in Western scientific contexts? And I think that that's possible. I think that you see them as tools, the context um, is how they're used. It determines whether they're beneficial or not in different ways. So rather than calling the psychedelics, you know, medicines or drugs, I would like to just call them neutral kind of tools. And how we want to put them to use is really up to us. And we can take drugs from um, other cultural traditions. The peyote, um, you know, is used by the Native American church. But and, and we hear all of this about psilocybin, but psilocybin came from the Mazatec Indians in Mexico. We're not using psilocybin in these studies with uh, those kind of traditions either. So I think tools is the better way to say it. And then um, this is just this quote from, um, and this is the long-term hope and the vision that I'll leave you with. Um, there are moments of love and open-heartedness that we are all together. There is no you are Jewish, Arab, Muslim, Christian. Everything was stripped. All this nonsense was out and only acceptance and love were present. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and I have to apologize to the uh, organizers for going a little bit long, but <laughs> but sorry. Um, so, do you want to see if there's more questions, or wait for them? Oh, oh, really? Okay, let's do way more questions. Yeah. Okay, great friend. Great, great, great. Okay. Howdy, Rick. Thank you so much. It's amazing to be here with you. You're honoring us with your presence, and it's awesome. So much work. Vice is versa. <laughs> <laughs> You've done so much work on the highest levels of this thing, um, and there are lots of there's more community grassroots efforts kind of springing up through psychedelic yeah. clubs and psychedelic yeah. societies. How can those efforts continue? without stepping on the toes of or undermining the work that's been done at the highest levels. All right, well, that's, that's, there, there's a division of uh, opinion about that. So I would say that, um, you know, MAPS is the only, um, MAPS is the only uh, sort of nonprofit or for-profit psychedelic drug company that has an advocacy team. So my personal view is that none of these drugs should be illegal. There should be a system of called licensed legalization where adults have these drugs um, like a driver's license. You go under super, eventually you'll, there'll be hundreds and thousands of psychedelic clinics. They will be for patients, then they'll spread out for family members, and then they'll become sites of initiation. So if you wanna get a license to do LSD, you go to a clinic, you take LSD under supervision, you know what you're in for, then you get a license, you buy it. And then if you misbehave, you get punished for what you misbehaved, and then you get your license taken away for a period of time. So the best example for that is alcohol. Loads of people lose their driver's license from drunk driving, but they don't lose their ability to buy alcohol. They buy alcohol, they kill people even though they don't have a driver's license. So we should make alcohol also a license legalization. I think we should do that for marijuana. We should do that for all the drugs. So my personal view is that um, 
talking about legalization doesn't hurt the work that we're doing to medicalize. To medicalize, it needs to be justified through science. We have to prove safety and efficacy on its own standards. And when you talk about legalization and the need for um, basic fundamental human rights for people to explore their consciousness, it makes the medicalization more of a conservative thing rather than on the edge. You know, now it's not even, we're not even talking about, you know, at least when we do the research. So the psilocybin people, though, have the view or have had the view that they don't want to talk about legalization, that, that the efforts in Denver to have psilocybin as the lowest enforcement variety in Oakland to have all plant medicines, and then you'll hear from uh, Sheree and Tom tomorrow about the Oregon Initiative. There is some concern in some of the psilocybin people that the more their, the research is used to justify policy change, the more the FDA and the DEA will try to crack down on the research. So I see absolutely no evidence of that happening, and I think it's the opposite. I think the more that you delegitimize prohibition, the more you legitimize the need to look at them in a scientific medical context. So from your question, I think the more activity there is on these grassroots levels, the better it is. And there's nothing that those people can do that would jeopardize the science. The main thing that we really need to do and why we have so much effort that we put into the Zendo project and a psychedelic harm reduction is in the 60s, the backlash was for political reasons. It was psychedelics identified with the counterculture, people protesting Vietnam, people giving Nixon a hard time and a lot of different things. Nixon said that his two main enemies were the civil rights group and the hippies. And um, John Ehrlichman was quoted as saying that they couldn't uh, criminalize their ideas, but they could go after these groups for the drugs they were using, criminalize them, break up their meetings, arrest their leaders, and try to weaken the movements that way. So that's sort of the, the political aspect of the repression of psychedelic research. But now the real um, impetus for dr the drug war still is parents worrying about their kids. And you hear that all the time. So I'd say that the biggest vulnerability of people who are talking about different kind of legalization scenarios is are there going to be a lot of problems you know, with people having difficult trips? Are loads of people going to now go to Denver to have mushroom ceremonies that the police are not, um, prop not arresting people, but then there's no integration, there's no preparation, they don't check their medicines, they have all these problems. So that's the biggest vulnerability is not the actual political change, but are they responsible in providing these experiences to a wider group of people. So that's the most important thing for people to watch out for. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much, Rick, for talking yeah. and all your hard work through these years. Thank you. Um, in Shannon's talk and in your talk, you guys both touched upon it, just how some of these medicines or uh, molecules have been involved in indigenous communities for yeah. thousands of years at times. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the integrity um, of MAP's relationship with some of those lineage carriers or people who have been working with these molecules yeah. for um, a long period of time. Well, Thank you. I'll start by saying I am so grateful that MDMA came from the lab <laughs> and that we don't have this whole long tradition from behind to, to, to negotiate with. Um, you know, w you have this idea that these uh, indigenous cultures are somehow pure state of nature and they're, they're this beautiful, pure thing. And, you know, how are we, who are we to change that or, or you know, thousands of years? But the ayahuasca churches are syncretic churches. They've blended with the oppressive, domineering Catholic church. They've adopted a lot of the symbols. So they have an enormous amount of wisdom in how they've developed it, but their structures, their symbol systems are not some pure state of nature thing. So the other part of it is that's very difficult is the power dynamics. So in general, you know, the shaman was kind of the, the powerful man, in, or usually men in the community. There were some shaman, women that were shaman that, you know, had this function as well. Like the oracles at Delphi were women. There, there were, um, but we have this um, general sense that a lot of times the shaman is the one that's healing the people. And so we've done the entire opposite. Our idea is that we help people heal themselves. And that's really what's going on. So that's this inner healer that we have, uh, you know, non-directive, we provide support. But, but so I'm, I'm concerned about some aspects, the dogma, 
you know, I was at the Uniao de Vegetal um, church ceremonies in Santa Fe before they got their Supreme Court um, approval. And at some point I went twice and then I was told if I wanted to come again, I would have to join the church. And they told their story of this church and it was all about how King Solomon went from Israel to um, the Amazon. Nobody knows that he did this. He sort of snuck out of town. And he, he is the one that figured out how to put the plants together. And, and I'm like, oh, great, okay, this is a metaphor, right? Some smart person. They're like, no, it's not a metaphor. It's King Solomon. He went to the Brazil and he did this. And I'm like, how could you expect me to believe that? <laughs> um, so I, I was not able to join the church, <laughs> even though I like the ayahuasca. <laughs> So I think that um, we need to respect and learn from the indigenous use as much as we can, but we are in our own different Western culture. So I'm a Reformed Jew, and one of the beautiful things about Reformed Judaism is that it's your obligation to engage with the ancient texts and update them for your current modern life. So I think that that's what we need to do. So we can honor and respect, but we don't have to copy and mimic exactly the way things were done that way. And so at least for us, it's a lot easier because what we're starting with is a molecule. I mean, um, yes, you can get it from sassafras, but it's not in sassafras. You know, you, you get something there, you have to modify it a bunch of steps. So, um, and I think that the power dynamics is a really interesting and new way that we really have to upgrade those traditions. Yeah. This will be our, this will be our last question. Hi. Um, I'm Deborah from Baltimore. Um, okay, so everyone got so excited about that slide up there that talks about that um, there's acceptance and love, and that is the ultimate. And, yeah. Um, everybody plugged into that. And knowing that we do heal ourselves and that the facilitator can help that, but we're really healing ourselves, when will the integration model become more about our infinite nature and our unlimited being? than about political division? Well, I would say um, I'm not sure, uh, but I think that the integration is really, when we're talking about trauma, the integration is about um, overcoming the trauma. You know, so it's, it, there, there can be sort of spiritual things that are brought into that. And actually, there's one thing I forgot to say, which is that um, the early work with LSD and psilocybin from the 50s and 60s, with alcoholics, with heroin addicts, with cancer patients, and the current research with psilocybin um, and also our work with LSD in Switzerland has demonstrated that there's a direct correlation between the depth of the mystical experience and therapeutic outcomes. The stronger this mystical sense of unity connection, the better people do, the better they overcome their fear of death, the better they get over addictions. However, with MDMA for PTSD, we use the exact same measures of spiritual experience. People score remarkably high on it, not as high as with psilocybin, but quite high. And there is no correlation between mystical experiences and reduction in PTSD symptoms. So it's a fundamentally different approach towards the therapeutic process for MDMA for PTSD compared to psilocybin and LSD, the classic psychedelics for other conditions. And that impacts how we do the integration. So I think that the integration for, um, for PTSD is more about this world. It's about your trust or lack of trust in others. It's about how you handle now that you've um, you know, addressed this, these traumas and you're no longer suppressing it. So I think that the integration process will be tailored towards the drug and the condition that people have been through. And so there will be a time where people are you know, taught about meditation or taught about other things to help them ground and integrate it. But I don't know that we're always going to, you know, that, that the next stage of evolution is going to be, you know, universal love as part of the integration process. So I, I, I don't know. Do, do you think that, can you say why you think, uh, you know, that'll, that would be beneficial or? Um, well, because I, I know that we're more than our situations and conditions. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know that when we focus on what we don't have, we get more of that. And I know that the, the real truth and, and our real ultimate existence is to go deep inside and, and that the power within you is always stronger than anything else. Yeah. So I know, I know as an integration provider myself, that's Great. my focus. And I, and I know that when, when I received um, 
psychedelics through um, a study. Um, I had great, I had really great guides, but I know that that wasn't, the focus was not um, my infinite nature. I had to go beyond that on my own. I had to do a lot of study. I had to, I, I mean, I had to do much more breathwork stuff. I, I'd already done lots of breathwork stuff. I had already been a breath worker, mm -hmm. but I know that, the, that that's the deepest connection for me is to go all the way to the source. So, our, you know, our source is responsible for our healing. And that, that's why I say that. I mean, I love this work so much. I think that psychedelics open us to our vibration, a higher vibration, but then it's up to us to stay in that vibration. And us staying in that vibration is, is the pivotal change. Yeah, I, I can see that. Although I, I do think that uh, for healing for PTSD, it's not always source, how you might call it. Again, we don't see, it, it requires, um, reviewing your biography, the things that have happened to you or the things that maybe have happened epigenetically through your relatives and coming to peace with that um, and basically replacing the memories that when you have these memories of trauma and they're connected with the fear, under MDMA, when you're feeling safe, then you're able to um, really have these um, the episodic memory for what happened increases. So people's memory for the trauma gets better under MDMA, but you're sort of, when you reconsolidate the memory, and maybe Gol can explain this more to us <laughs> if you want, um, but the, during this memory reconsolidation phase, you're basically swapping out the emotions from fear to this sense that you had a, it's more peaceful, you accept it, and it's in your past. And so then when you remember it again, you remember the new emotion and the episode, so that's not necessarily this kind of mystical sense. Another round of applause. Thank you very much, Rick Dobler. Okay, we'll, we'll talk more about it. Thank you very much. It's super great to be here.